Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ on this, the third Sunday in Lent. If you have your bulletin with you, I sent it by email this morning. You might want to pause this and grab your bulletin. And we're going to begin with our call to worship. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are troubled, and I will give you rest. Come, you who are burdened by regrets and anxieties, you who are broken in body and spirit, you who are torn by relationships and by doubt, you who feel deeply within yourselves the divisions and the injustice, injustices and brokenness of our world. Come, for Jesus invites us to bring him our brokenness. If you have the hymns that I sent out this morning, you may want to pause and just sing them together as a family or sing a verse or two or sing them to the birds or the trees or whatever you would like to do. And the first one is great is thy faithfulness. Would you please now join me in our opening prayer? O oh Lord, your mercy is over all your works. May your healing hand rest upon us. May your life-giving spirit breath flow into every cell of our bodies and into the depths of our souls, restoring us to wholeness and strength for service in your kingdom. Amen. Let us take just a moment to confess our sins before God, and these may be your own sins, or this may be the sins of our whole nation or of our world, our corporate sins together. Let's take just a moment to confess those to God and ask for his forgiveness. Hear the good news. The Lord saves with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our sermon this morning continues our series that we started several weeks ago. We've been in a series called Outstretched Arm, where we talk about God's steadfast love that endures forever, even in places of brokenness. We are not following the lectionary in this Lenten season. We have chosen some other scriptures this morning. And so we've been traveling along this road of thinking about places of brokenness where that steadfast love exists. And so we have talked about mental illness. We have talked together about Alzheimer's and dementia. And this morning we consider anxiety and depression, which seems relevant in this particular, uh, this particular week where we find ourselves. This is certainly a week unlike any other that I've experienced as um, so many places are, are shutting down and canceling and we are all staying home and all of this to um, show our love for the most vulnerable people in our population to give care to the doctors and nurses among us so that we don't endanger them or overwhelm them and, and their medical practices. And so it truly has been an astounding week. And throughout this morning, we will remember that God's steadfast love does indeed endure forever. Dante was a poet and a writer. You might remember the Divine Comedy. And one of the things he wrote uh, in the Divine Comedy, he said this, In the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in a dark wood. In the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in the dark wood. The I in this statement is clearly the poet himself as Dante, but who's the hour in the middle of our life's journey? Friends, that's the rest of us our life's journey, the rest of us who may be plagued by anxiety or depression or loneliness or loss. It's the rest of us who might be struggling with fear. This week, your fear might be the fear of the coronavirus, maybe of getting it, maybe the fear of our national response to it. 
um, just all of the repercussions of the things that we're having to do to keep one another safe, that may be bringing fear. It may be the rest of us who are concerned about school children who are going to go without their school lunches and their breakfast for the next two weeks, for um, doctors and nurses, for workers who aren't receiving paychecks for the next two weeks. Um, maybe that's you. And so these fears are, are real. It may be the rest of us who are worried about those who already have anxiety or depression and all of this that's going on is exacerbating that condition um, in this unprecedented pandemic. And so all of us to some degree are walking through a dark wood. And in the midst of this dark wood, we can't help but ask, is God present here? Does the Spirit give life in the dark wood? Maybe you haven't thought about Dante in a long time, that's fair. Maybe you haven't probably read anything by him since your senior year of high school. So I'm gonna give you a little refresher this morning. Dante was this poet who in his early life um, really led a charmed existence in Florence, Italy. Florence was this um, sort of magical place at the time that he was alive and it had amazing art, it had uh, architecture. It was a place of worldwide banking and trade. And if it was this jewel of Italy, Dante was this facet that made it shine. And so he really had everything. He was a diplomat. And so he went on a diplomatic mission to Tuscany. And while he was there for a whole bunch of complicated reasons, he was exiled. And this broke his heart because he really wanted to come home to his city, to Florence. He tried everything really to get back there. He schemed, he plotted, he reached out to, um, to military leaders. He reached out to other exiles. He even uh, tried to make friends with former enemies, anything he could do that would allow him to go back home to Florence. But the sad truth is he never really did get to go back home. In 1321, he died in exile. And so his book, The Divine Comedy, in it there's this dark wood. And for him, the dark wood is that place where we are ripped out of our normal existence. And we're thrust into this horrible place where there's uncertainty and um, emptiness and temptation and confusion. For Dante, it was his exile writ large into the dark wood. And so the dark wood was really the entryway to hell. It was um, a place where, where we're utterly separated from all that we love and especially from God. And so nobody, nobody wants to go into the dark wood unless they have to. And that sounds reasonable, right? No one wants to go into the dark wood. But Dante's word isn't the last word because there's this whole other stream of Christian thinkers and we call them the mystics. And the mystics, um, they, we call them mystics because they sought out a mystical union with God through prayer. And they're going to look at that dark wood a whole lot differently. They have different names for it. Some of them call it the dark wood, but some of them call it the cloud of unknowing or the dark night of the soul or even the fifth mansion. And whether you're in a mansion or on a cloud or in a dark night, they found that there was something comforting even in those places of suffering. And the comforting thing was in the, in the midst of suffering is sometimes where God is almost supernaturally present in a way that we can't access God in our workaday life. And so in, even in the midst of all of these hardships and the soul gripping fear of these dark places, they believed that there, we receive this wondrous gift of God's presence there. 
My friend Adam reminded me recently of a saying by Julian of Norwich. She's, uh, she was a mystic. She survived the Black Plague and went on to continue writing. And when she talked about her own time in the dark wood, that time of uh, during the plague, she writes, uh, thinking back to Jeremiah and even to Jesus, she writes this, he didn't say, thou shalt, shalt not be tempested. He didn't say, thou shalt not be travailed or thou shalt not be diseased. But he said, thou shalt not be overcome. So which is it? This dark wood where we find ourselves. Is it, um, as Dante said, punishment from our sin where all is lost, where we are utterly separate from God? Or could it be more of what the mystics were saying? Could, were, were they on to something where those darkest moments of our life are places where the Spirit of God is supernaturally present. If you've walked in the shadow of the valley of death, if you've had a time of depression or anxiety, which of these rings true for you? One of the people who really was plunged into the dark wood was Job. And his, the story of his downfall is um, his downfall at the hands of Satan is really one of the most tragic in the whole Bible. Might be one of the most tragic in all of human existence. If you remember the story, Job is this man who's riding high. He has, he's righteous. He has everything that he could ever want or ever need. And when he's at the top of his game, there's this really bizarre set of circumstances where Satan uh, schemes to take away everything, really just for sport, just, just to see what would happen. And so in the midst of all of this, Job loses everything that's important to him. His family dies due to illness and, and catastrophe, and he loses his workers. His business goes away. I mean, this feels like it's torn from today's headlines. He loses his house. He becomes sick. He gets a disease and it makes him miserable. And uh, he's just struck with every unimaginable thing you could happen. If anyone ever was said to walk in the dark woods in the middle of his life's journey, it was definitely Job. And so he's sitting there on the ash heap, just scratching his sores in his despondency and in his depression and in his misery. And his friends show up and they are 100% Team Dante. They are 100% on board with the idea that this place where he finds himself is due to his sin. And so they begin to ask him things like, well, what did you do to deserve this? Have you read friends like this when maybe you're in a dark place and they're trying to help you, but the questions they ask maybe aren't so helpful? So Job's friends ask him things like, um, well, you know, what did you do? What can you change about yourself to, to change this for the future? And so the fixers show up and the fixers say things like, well, why don't you change jobs or, you know, go to a new school, try a new degree, or some of the things I'm hearing this week. Why don't you just take a vacation in the midst of all of this pain? Or the worst, I think, maybe of all of these, well, count your blessings of what you have, because certainly this should have, this could have been worse. One of his friends who's really robust and healthy and doing well shows up and says, well, I'm not sure what you're concerned about. Look at me. God has blessed me. And this friend is just unable to recognize that in his own life, he actually too is going to die. He might be healthy in that moment, but we all do come to dust. And so Job's friends give him horrible, terrible advice. But in the midst of all that, Job discovers a wondrous gift. He discovers this, 
that despite all the appearances to the contrary, in the dark woods, there is life that grows there. There is life growing. And so he cuts through all of their advice and he reminds them that the God who made the world will never cease to sustain that world with his very breath. And so this is our scripture uh, for this morning. One of the scriptures is from Job 12, 7 through 10. Hear these words from the Lord. But ask the animals and they will teach you. The birds of the air and they will tell you. Ask the plants of the earth and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you, who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. That's the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Job's friends are pummeling him with all of this advice, and he's saying, this is the, this is the Lord. The Lord um, holds our life in his hands, and the Lord offers us the breath that sustains us. In fact, later on, Job will say, as long as my breath is in me, and the spirit breath of God is in my nostrils, I will not speak falsely. Could the mystics have been right? That God is there. God is here in the dark woods as close as your breath. Our founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, he, he read the mystics a lot. They are um, an undercurrent of a lot of the theology and a lot of the beliefs that we talk about in the Methodist church. And I love the way he talks about the spirit breath of God. He says, we experience the Holy Spirit as a constant breathing back and forth, a continual action of God upon our soul. And then the reaction of our soul back to God. And with every breath that we take, the Spirit fills our lungs. And with every exhalation that we breathe out, our breath combines with God's breath in and out and in and out from the day you were born until the day that you die. God's spirit breath sustains us. Jack Levison is a writer who writes a lot about the Holy Spirit. He's someone that, that I read frequently. And he talks about what Job means when Job says, as long as my breath is in me and the spirit breath of God is in my nostrils. And he calls this the bare bones assertion uh, of, or the bare bones expression of the power of the spirit to give life even in the valley of death. Even in the midst of the dark woods, the spirit just needs a tiny little toehold, a time, an instant, a little spark, and given that, it can give life. Jack writes about it saying, um, he goes, think about the Big Bang. There's a nanosecond glimpse of energy, just this split second of vitality. And the Big Bang occurs in a moment's time and all the energy of the universe is traced back to that one little moment. And he says, close your eyes, you'll miss it. Look away and it will evaporate. But that one little split second of time is all the time that the spirit needs to generate life. As long as God's breath is in you and God's spirit breath is in your nostrils. That's every minute of life. Every minute that you breathe, God is giving life. So this week, a friend of mine, her name is Allison, she sent me a picture of a, um, from her backyard. I'm going to show it to you. I hope this captures on the camera. This is this little picture of this asparagus shoot 
that is coming through her backyard. So there's just this barren backyard. Nothing is growing seemingly, but in the midst of that, this little asparagus is coming up. And this little asparagus, to me, I looked at it and I thought that is such a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That in the midst of this depression and anxiety and darkness where nothing seems to grow, up comes this little shoot that represents life. And even though we're still in the winter, there has been record-breaking rain all, uh, all February into March. This horrible virus is galloping across the globe, and yet this little shoot of energy pokes through the soil, reminding us that in the dark woods, there is life. For Job's friends, the woods are, are too dark. Their, his burden is too much. It's too heavy. They don't want to carry it. They want to rush him through those dark woods because they are uncomfortable with his sadness. They can't handle his despair. It's somewhat comforting for us to know that this desire for instantaneous reward and quick fixes has its roots thousands of years ago in a whole other society. There really is this reason why uh, patience is sometimes called the queen of all virtues. But his friends aren't all bad, at least not in the beginning. And so before they went awry with this misguided advice, they did something that we can all do when we encounter a friend who is walking through the dark woods. And this is from uh, Job 2, 12 through 13. But I want you to hear what Job's friends did originally because this is a good uh, thought for all of us. It says, when they saw Job from a distance, they didn't recognize him. And they raised their voices and they wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. And here it is. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was great. Seven days and seven nights, they sat with him in his suffering, and no one said a word, not one word. Instead, they offered him their presence, a listening ear, and they gave him room to breathe, just breathe to breathe in the healing, sustaining power of the Holy Spirit that gives life even in the dark wood. Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be made truly wise, and that we will ever enjoy your consolations. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Grace and peace to you as you continue to move through this Sunday. Think about those words from, from Job, uh, from earlier we were talking about in Job 12. And he says, go outside and look at the birds and the trees and um, the wind and all of these things. And they'll teach you. They'll show you. They'll tell you that in the midst of the darkness, that God's spirit breath will sustain you. Go in peace.